Psalms of Ascent, and in particular, one that I received lately just spoke about how it's been so refreshing to be reminded of the fact that as Christians, we are pilgrims here on earth. This is not our home. We're just passing through. And we're on a journey. We've set our course for eternity to be with God and to worship Him forever. And every day we do that. Every day we travel, we are practicing praise in preparation to worship God in eternity. But there's also true that each week we do the same thing. We practice praise all week long so that we can gather on Sunday morning to worship God together. And um, what, what we're looking at today in these two psalms is um, some closing thoughts. One, the first psalm speaks about the unity that we have in the body of Christ and within God. And then the other one is the blessing. It's like the benediction um, to these psalms. And part of it, I think, that was encouraging early on was to try and put ourselves in the setting of those first pilgrims uh, back, in, back when these were written. Um, you'll recall that I mentioned that three times a year, the nation of Israel was to travel to Jerusalem, that holy city, and there together as a nation worship God on Mount Zion. And so today, let me just take us back through that idea again as we try and enter into the mindset of these individuals. So you've started on your journey as a family, just a handful of you that are traveling together. And you've left, and you're beginning to praise God. And off in a distance, you can see another family that lives close by, and they join with you, and you travel together. And the first psalm that you sing, Psalm 120, is kind of an odd psalm as you sing together. It's a psalm of distress. You are pained by the fact that you dwell among those who hate God. It's discouraging to realize that there are those who do not love God like you love God. And so you sing that first psalm of distress, and yet you affirm the fact that you desire peace. Peace with God and peace with others. As you travel, you see others traveling as well, and now you're joined together, and all the voices are joining in in song, and you're praising God through these psalms. And that first night, you set up camp now with maybe 30 or 40 families gathered together. The fires are going as the meal is being prepared. The sun is setting in the distance. And imagine this Psalm 121. Someone off in the distance cries out, I lift my eyes up, up to the mountains. And you can see Mount Zion in a distance. I lift my eyes up, up to the mountains. Where does my help come from? And there's another one in a distance echoes back. My help comes from the Lord who made heaven and earth. And the whole camp begins to sing together before the evening meal. And if it were in our modern way, we would sing it like we do. Oh, how I need you, Lord. You're my only hope. You're my only prayer. I will wait for you. So just imagine the camp as it continues that night to sing these psalms, these psalms of ascent as the fires burn out and people go to sleep. The next day, you continue to travel, and now you're making your way through the mountains that circle Jerusalem. It's a bit scary because there's places where individuals can hide. And so now the psalms of ascent continue as you consider God's mercy and His protection and the security that you have in Him. And you continue on, and you come to that base camp below Mount Zion that night, and there's excitement in the air. The next morning, you're going to get up, you're going to make that final climb up to the holy city, and you go to rest that night, and you're again thinking about God's goodness. And you wake up the next day, and off everyone goes. They pack up the tents. They move northward or eastward, wherever they are, coming up to the mountaintop. And there's a thought that comes over the group. You're getting ready to enter that holy city. And it's going to be a very important time of worshiping God. And so the one psalm that really comes to mind is the psalm where you cry out for forgiveness. Because you realize there's a need to be right with God as you enter into that city to worship Him. And so you cry out and beg God for mercy. And as you arrive on the whole, into the holy city, there's gladness. And you have that next psalm in mind that talks about how it's compact in Jerusalem. It's a very tight setting. There's more people there than it should be there because during the year there's fewer. And everyone gathers these three times. And so it's very tight. And you're going to go to the temple. And it's going to be a time of restoration and refreshment and blessings from God. And then you see it. You see the temple. You see the temple that Solomon built. And then there's this mind about how that temple came into being. And you think about the Davidic covenant and you sing Psalm 132. And you think about the fact that David made a vow to the Lord that he would not rest until he built a house for the Lord. And David brought back the Ark of the Covenant, that thing that reminded them of God's particular blessing. But it was more than just David's vow. You think about God's vow to David. How God has made a promise that there will always be one in the line of David that will sit upon the throne 
a king, a lord of the people. And while you don't fully understand that there is coming a king of kings and a lord of lords who will rule and reign forever upon that throne. And now the day has come and it's time to enter into worship and these two psalms are in the front of your mind and you're singing out and notice that you're singing out to one another in these psalms. You're crying out to one another, behold, behold, listen, pay attention, this is important, this is significant, I want everyone to pay attention. You're crying out to one another, pay attention. We have gathered here and we have a great blessing from God and that is unity. We are one people, united in God in order to worship and serve Him as we should. But also listen and pay attention, this is important, this is good stuff. Namely that we have come to bless the Lord. But more important than our blessing is the fact that He blesses us. And so these two final psalms, as you're getting ready to go into temple to worship God, are of particular interest. This is good stuff. Unity and the blessings of God. So let's get into these psalms, and we're going to move rather quickly through them, beginning with the unity in Psalm 133. Listen to verse 1 again. Behold how good and how pleasant it is for brethren to dwell together in unity. How good, how pleasant, how important it is for brethren to dwell together in unity. This morning what I want to do in these psalms, and this one in particular, I want to move to the less, from the lesser to the greater. I want to move from Israel right away into the church of the living God. I want to talk about true Israel. So I'll talk a little bit about this psalm in its context as far as it related to Israel, but I really want to focus heavily on the unity that we have in the Lord Jesus Christ. I want to make four statements from this psalm about unity. And then I want to come back through those same four points if you have your bulletins, and I want to give an application for each one. So I'll work through it all the way through the four points and then come back and revisit it. Number one, the first point that I want to make is that true unity is established and maintained when people are right with the Lord. Anchor yourself with that one. That's very important. True unity is established and maintained when people are right with the Lord. In Ephesians chapter 2, it speaks about the unity that we have in Jesus Christ. And it reminds us that at one time, we were dead in our sins and trespasses. We were not sick. We weren't struggling. We were dead. And there was animosity between us and God. But God, who's rich in mercy and grace, He saved us. Even though we were sinners, even though we were dead, He made us alive. And He made us and gave us a relationship with Him. But in doing that, through the blood of Jesus Christ, he did more than break down that barrier between us and God. He broke down the barrier between us and other people. You see, the unity that we have in Christ gives us unity with one another, and that dividing wall is gone. Now Jews and Gentiles can come together and worship the one true living God, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, and His Son, the Lord Jesus Christ. And this is what God has done for us, and it's wonderful. But here's the key. And as much as He's given us that unity, we are to maintain it. And one of the ways we do that is staying in constant tune with the Lord. Think of it this way. Think about a band or an orchestra. If they're going to play something that is beautiful and in harmony with one another, then they all have to be tuned to the common thing. Now, I'm not a musician, but I understand that typically what you do is somebody on the piano hits middle C. And everyone gets their instruments tuned to middle C. Or if you have a tuning fork, if you have other instruments. But the point is, they're all to the common tone so they can play together. If you're in harmony with a group over here, and another group over here is in harmony with one another, and another group over here is in harmony with one another, that's not going to work. Because when you come together, it's going to sound odd. They all have to be to this common pitch. And it's important for us to be right with God so that we can be right with one another. And this psalm says it's good and it's pleasant. It's precious. It's refreshing. Look at verses 2 and 3. It is like the precious oil upon the head running down on the beard, the beard of Aaron running down on the edge of his garments. It's like the dew of Hermon descending upon the mountains of Zion. For there the Lord commanded the blessing, life forevermore. Now this reference to Aaron is something that's probably kind of difficult for us to think about because it's not part of our culture. But Aaron, the great high priest, or the high priest before the great high priest, and his family who served in this capacity had to wear particular garments in order to fulfill their role as the high priest. And especially true when they went in behind the veil um, for the Day of Atonement. But Aaron was anointed for ministry. 
there was oil poured upon him. You can read about that in Exodus, I think, chapter 30, and also Leviticus 8. And oftentimes we think about anointing with oil as like a drop of oil, like on the forehead. But this passage tells us it was pouring of oil. There was a lot of it. He was anointed with oil so that it ran down on his face, on his beard, and even on his garments. And over and over again in Scripture, the idea of oil and anointing has a reference to the Holy Spirit. Now, I want you to put this together in your mind. In particular, the breastplate that Aaron had had 12 stones representing each one of the tribes of Israel. And that oil that came over him made it all shimmer and glisten. And that oil represented the anointing of the Spirit to bring that diversity and to give it unity and to make it brilliant and glorious. That's my second thought. It is the Holy Spirit in true unity that gives glory to diversity. Have you ever thought about that? We have such great diversity, all kinds of likes and dislikes, distinctions of ages, occupations, location. And yet it's the Spirit that brings it all together and puts a shine on it like an anointing of oil to say we are one people serving for one purpose. And therefore, not only is it the work of the Holy Spirit, but true unity is enjoyable to those who are involved. When you have true unity, there's no animosity, there's no hidden agendas, there's no bloated expectations, but rather there's a desire to serve one another, to consider one another, to minister in joint efforts for the good of other individuals. If there is true unity, there'll be kindness and there'll be forgiveness. This is what the New Testament speaks about as koinonia, a true fellowship, a sharing, a coming together. And so unity is established and maintained when people are right with the Lord. True unity is brought about by the Holy Spirit who gives glory to diversity. True unity is enjoyable for those who are involved. And true unity is attractive to outsiders. When individuals look from the outside and they see us, and remember what Jesus said? They will know that you are my disciples if you have love for one another. True unity is attractive to people outside. You know, this time of year is a very festive time with lots of decorations. There are some people who spend hours and hours getting the tree ready, the lights up, getting all the decorations out, and just make it look really beautiful. But have you also noticed that in some ways we kind of celebrate things that are ugly at this time of year? How many of you were part of a white elephant gift exchange this year? A couple of you, those things are hideous, some of those gifts. The one of them that we went to, they actually said there's a trash can at the door on your way out so you can throw it away. And then what about ugly sweaters? You've got some of those going on? I better look, did anybody wear one today? You know, those Christmas sweaters, like, my goodness, this is, I think there's actually parties, right? We have something at our house or tradition that I started years ago that's kind of the same way. Um, my, and my kids are really excited about it. They're all coming over today. This is a really big event. We've had to celebrate Christmas in shifts this year because all the kids come and going and doing different things. So we started on the 22nd with some gifts, then the 23rd, then the 24th. Then it was just uh, my wife and I and our youngest son for Christmas morning. So it's just been all. But today is going to be the day when we're all together, all the whole family. And every time they've come in, they've looked around the corner where their two special gifts are that I give them every Christmas. And they're like, can we have them now? I said, no, you cannot. You have to wait till we're all together. You're probably wondering, what are those gifts? These sound just great. They are. They're really good. <laughs> Everybody gets wiper blades for their cars. That's gift number one. That's really good, isn't it? Because some of you don't change your wiper blades as often as you're supposed to. My kids do every year. Safety first, people. That's important. And I have a new rule this year. You have to know what size your wiper blades are before I give them to you. Okay? So there will be a quiz. But believe it or not, that's really not the gift that they desire the most sitting in the corner. The second gift is a toilet seat. <laughs> My kids for years have gotten a toilet seat from me on Christmas. And you might say, well, why? Why do they get a toilet seat? This is very important. <laughs> Several Christmases ago, I went to a family for family's house for Christmas. And the toilet seat was very, very nasty. And I thought to myself, I don't want to go to someone's house to a nasty toilet seat. So my kids will learn how to change the toilet seat so that one day when I come and visit them, <laughs> there will be a clean toilet seat for me. 
So this, this is good, isn't it? Y'all are thinking right now, we gotta add that to our family thing. <laughs> so today they will get their toilet seats and they will change them appropriately and all will be good. <laughs> now you might say that's kind of an ugly gift. I don't think so. I think it's a rather clean gift. <laughs> I think the toilet seat that needs to be replaced is the ugly gift. Set that aside for just a moment. <clears throat> when others look at us, what do they see? Do they see that old, nasty thing? Or do they see freshness in Christ? You know, one of the pastors that I respect greatly said, this year, why don't you really go above and beyond at Christmas time? Why don't you be the type of people that makes what you do attractive? And you be the ones who give more than anybody else gives. You be the ones who decorate more than anyone else decorates. You be the one who demonstrates love more than anyone else demonstrates in this world. We should be an attractive people to those outside that they see Christ in us the way we do things. We shouldn't be dirty and dingy. We shouldn't be that ugly thing. We should be the brilliance of the Spirit's work in our lives. And it should be part in how we live together in unity. Now let's work back through these and let's make four applications based upon these four points. First of all, if unity is established and maintained when people are right with the Lord, then we need to make sure we are right with God. Can I get an amen on that? Amen. It is coming. This is the last Sunday of 2015. If you are not right with God, today is the day of salvation. Today, if you hear a still small voice, do not harden your heart, but rather repent of your sin and trust in Jesus Christ. A lot of you maybe are trusting in the fact that your parents were raised or raised you in the church or that your parents are Christians. It is enough. Today should be the day that you trust in Jesus Christ and know Him personally. You've got to be right with God. This is of the utmost importance before this day passes. If you don't know for certain, if you die today that you go to heaven, make sure today is the day that you have confidence in the saving work of Jesus Christ. But not only that, you and I should be a people that continue to be in a right relationship with God, and that is done as God sanctifies us, and He does His work through His Spirit, but this is something that is up to us as well. We participate in this, making sure that day in and day out, we're living for the Lord. Go with me to Ephesians chapter 4. Ephesians chapter 4. Ephesians is a book that talks greatly about the unity that we have in Christ. And Ephesians chapter 4, beginning in verse 1, and you can read the rest of this chapter later on because it speaks about how God gives to us gifts of individuals and spiritual gifts so that we can serve one another. But it's all anchored and it's all founded in these opening six verses in the very triune of God. Look at Ephesians chapter 4 verse 1. Paul, having laid down the foundation of the work of Christ at Calvary to bring us into a right relationship with God, he now gives the responsibility, chapter 4, verse 1, I therefore, the prisoner of the Lord, beseech you to walk worthy of the calling with which you were called, with all lowliness and gentleness, with long-suffering, bearing with one another in love, endeavoring to keep the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. There is one body and one Spirit, just as you were called in one hope of your calling, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all, who is above all, and through all, and in you all. The unity that we have is based upon the very Godhead, who Father, Son, and Spirit are united together. And the unity He brings us into, He says to us, be responsible. Make sure you're right with God so you can be right with one another. Every day, we're on a pilgrimage. And every day, we should be concerned. Is my heart in tune with my God and my Savior right now? Am I living for Him or am I living for myself? There is so much in this world that will distract us and take us away. There's so many causes and concerns. But folks, there's only one thing that's really important. And that's our relationship with Jesus Christ, with God the Father. And that's all accomplished by the Spirit. But we've got to work at it. Paul says, I beseech you, walk worthy of your calling. So we've got to make sure we're right with God. Number two. We should celebrate in and not divide over unity, or over diversity, sorry. We should celebrate in, but not divide over diversity. <clears throat> one day I'm going to have time to sit down and write that book, my list, your list, and his list. Um, I worked on one of my books, in part, I got about two-thirds done. Oh, it is that book, that's the one I've been working on. <laughs> I need to finish it up. And that, 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 that concern for me is so important because there are so many things over which believers who have trusted in Jesus Christ will separate over. And it is such a sad thing. 
you know, everyone will talk about the need for those things that are essential, unity in that, and those things that are not essential to have diversity and love and all of that. But everybody comes up with their own list of what is essential. And there is no definitive list of what's essential. I would recommend, though, if I can, start with the most basic thing is essential. The Lord Jesus Christ. Anchor yourself with that foundational, fundamental truth. Even Peter made that comment, right? Who do men say that I am? Who do you say that I am? Thou art the Christ, the Son of the living God. That's the foundational anchor. Then after that, be careful to add much more to the essential list. Keep it, keep it simple. Keep the main thing the main thing. And don't divide over those secondary issues. You know some of the secondary issues. End times. Does anybody here absolutely for certain know how this thing's going to play itself out? Except for that Christ wins and we win with him? You know, you can study, you can be diligent, and I think we should be. There's a blessing for us in reading the book of Revelation. We're told as much. But to say definitively, you've got the answer down 100%, and then you're going to divide with somebody over disagrees with you? I don't think that's what God would have for us. And then there's other things, too. I'm thankful in our church we have a diversity of music. But do you know a lot of Christians will divide over music worship? I, I, you might find it surprising, but I have people who tell us, you don't do enough hymns. And then the very next day I'll have someone say to me, you do too many hymns. And then I'll say to somebody, say, you've got to do more praise songs. And somebody say, you do too many praise songs. And people will divide over these issues. You know, in years past, there's been other things. Um, are you allowed to go to the movie theater, or do you wait till it comes out on VHS and then rent it, you know? Which is more godly? You're going to watch the same show, but do you do it in a public setting at a theater? How we educate our children can be very divisive. And people are very passionate about how they do that. And you should be. You should be confident. But I don't think that's a reason to divide. I found out this last year something I didn't know about. That people now as Christians actually divide over uh, medicine and their approach. And some people get all up in arms about this thing. And, I, and there, why can't there be diversity with that? Um, I had someone just hand me an article today about new approaches to deal with cancer. Man, the Lord is good, isn't he? That he would reveal to us different things and alternatives. But should we divide over that? Should we hunker down and say, if you don't do it this way, you're missing the point. You're not as spiritual. You're not as godly. You don't love God. You don't love your children. We should celebrate in our diversity and not divide over it. And can I give you a quick thought that I'm convinced of? For those who have a bunch of rules or regulations in their life, they're actually the weaker believer. Because the Bible speaks about the strong Christian being led by the Spirit. It's the weak who have to have a bunch of rules and regulations by which to govern their lives. And I'm convinced that typically there's a deeper sadness, there's a deeper unsettledness in them. That they're not at peace with the grace of God. That they're constantly striving, coming with more rules and regulations. I believe we should have convictions. We should even have preferences. But these things should not divide us. We should celebrate diversity, not divide over it. Number three, this will help us to do that. We've got to get our eyes off of ourselves. We've got to get them upon Jesus Christ. And we've got to be like him, humbly serve one another. Amen? We spend so much time focused on ourselves. We've got to spend our, get our eyes on him and spend time serving with one another. This last two years has been for me as a pastor a difficult couple of years because we've had so many people leave CBC in the last two years. 25 families have left CBC the last couple of years. And by and large, there's only been a couple of them that moved because of military moves. But by and large, a lot of people were individuals retiring for a second time and then moving away. But there's also been a couple of families who've decided to go to church elsewhere. And that is always painful. Now, I can report to you there hasn't been a single one of them that has said it's because there's been a failure either in handling the word or the integrity of the leadership. Not that I know of. And I always follow up and ask people. Not a single one of them said that's been the case. They might have thought that, but they didn't say it. But there have been some individuals that seems like they just were looking for something different. And that's sad. I don't know how else to say it. I mean, it hurts my feelings. But it's also sad to me, more importantly, because I think there's something missing in the sense of serving one another in the body of Christ. I realize that there's a global church. So don't misunderstand me. I understand that. And I know that as you move from one church to another, you're still in the body of Christ.
But there is something significant about the local church. And it saddens me to think that people who have especially been there for years together with other believers would say, I no longer want to be here. I'm looking for something different. I'm not content any longer to serve the people that I've loved and who've loved me for so long. Bouncing from church to church, I think, is not a healthy thing to do. There has to be a resolve to stick to it, to be committed, and to serve. You know, I thought this last week about something. When I thought about Jesus Christ and his bride, I thought to myself, and this I'll probably flush this out for you in more context at a later date. I thought when Christ looked at his bride, she was not attractive. He didn't love his bride because she was attractive. But rather it's his love that makes his bride attractive. And oftentimes in our relationships, we not, might not view one another as important or as significant. And they might not even be that attractive because of the way they're living, them, they're living their lives. But actually, I think it's our love for one another that makes us attractive. That we would care for one another and serve one another. And we need to work at this, folks. Unity is given to us, but it has to be maintained. And it does take effort. You can't maintain unity by sitting on the sidelines or being passive. You've got to be actively engaged. My fourth application is this. We really need to make sure that we're thinking about eternal significant things. We've got to think about that which is eternal, of eternal significance, and that is our final destination and our witness. Too much time is wasted. Too much energy, too much emotion is wasted when relationships are not right. And it's very painful. Think about someone that you're close to that you really love. Think back now, how long ago was it that you wasted a whole day because you were upset with them? Or a couple of days? Was it really worth it? All that emotion? Wouldn't it be better just to get it right and to move on and enjoy the time that God has given us? Isn't life too short to be wasted that way? I think it is. Every day is a pilgrimage for us to come before the Lord finally in heaven. And he is the one who gives us the blessing of life forevermore. All right, so let's go back now and look at Psalm 134. We'll be actually be a little bit quicker on this particular psalm. We are to bless the Lord who blesses us, Psalm 134. Listen again to this psalm. Behold, listen, pay attention. Bless the Lord, all you servants of the Lord, who by night stand in the house of the Lord. Lift up your hands in the sanctuary and bless the Lord. The Lord who made heaven and earth bless you from Zion. You know, one of the things I failed to mention in the last psalm was Mount Hermon. And the notion that it's very refreshing. And I think this last psalm speaks about this as well. Mount Hermon was further north of Jerusalem. And you could see it at a great distance. It was a very tall mountain. And this passage says that this unity that we have is like the dew from this mountain that comes down. Probably not a really big deal to us because we're accustomed to having water, fresh water. But in Israel, there, were a couple of, there was a time during the year when it was no rain. It was very, very dry. And they were dependent upon the moisture that came down from Mount Hermon. And this is the place from which the Lord says that he commanded the blessing. When it says dew, don't think of it as just a dribble. This is it melted, came down, and it was a strong, refreshing, needed moisture. And that's the idea that's being presented here. And it's from this mountain and that God has commanded life forevermore, and therefore we bless the Lord, and he blesses us. Folks, number one, there is no longer a need for us to go to temple. Because we are the temple. Amen? We don't have to go to a place anymore. We are the temple of God. We no longer have a situation where there's a few who are ordained as priests. We are all priests of our God and King. We are royal priesthood according to 1 Peter. So number one, no longer need to go to temple. We are the temple, but we sure should come together to worship. Number two, this psalm reminds us that to bless the Lord requires active worship. It requires active worship. These are individuals, it says, all the servants of the Lord who by night stand in the house of the Lord, lift up your hands in the sanctuary and bless the Lord. We, by and large, as a church, are not very active in our worship. And I want to encourage you, it's okay to be active in worship. We're, we tend to want to either praise others or exalt ourselves, but we need to be those who adore the Lord Jesus Christ. And it's okay on occasion for someone to say, Amen. Can I get an Amen? amen. You can do that. I get, there you go. Thank you very much. <laughs> well done. Well done. It, it's, it's, it's helpful for you to stay engaged. It's encouraging to the, whoever is presenting the word. Now, be careful. You don't have to do it in such a way that you draw attention to yourself. 
And, and if, if someone beside you is falling asleep, don't do that. Just give them an elbow, okay? You don't have to wake them up with an amen. But even, what about a raising of a hand? You know, is that beyond our sense and sensibility? As we're praising God to lift up our hands? You know, the Jewish people were a people who were very vibrant in the worship of God. They would dance before the Lord. We should be a people who are not afraid to express some physical activity in our worship. Again, don't draw attention to yourself. But if you do it in the right way, it just adds to that experience as we come into His presence. To be mindful that we worship Him with our whole body. Not just our minds, not just our heart, but even our physical bodies as we praise the Lord. The third thing is this. Our hope from this psalm, we're reminded, is secure. Our hope is secure. Eternal life, life forevermore, because who is the one that brings it about? It is the very Lord, verse 3, who made heaven and earth. Have you ever thought about that? The power of God to speak all things into existence. Do you realize there was a time when this territory didn't exist and God spoke it into existence, when this globe did not exist and God said, let's put a thing out there called an earth. He hung the stars. They are expanding in the universe. Our God spoke it all into existence and he maintains it by this very same power. Um, parents, we live in a time where the children are very much engaged in media. Everyone's got their devices. It's handheld. It's a little pad. It's a big screen TV. And all of the eyes are on this stuff. Make your children go outside. <laughs> well, not when they're sick, okay? Wait till they're healthy, but then send them outside. Yes. Say, go outside and look at God's creation. God created it. Take them out on a starry night and say, look up. Look at how magnificent it is. When it starts to snow, bundle them up and send them outside. Say, look at the snowflakes. Every one of them is different. This coming spring, as the things start to bloom, say, let's go look at the flowers. Let's look at the trees. Let's examine God's creation. Look up to the heavens. They declare the glory of God. And it reminds you that He's an all-powerful God. And certainly, if He can create this universe, He can hold you in His hand for all eternity. And nothing can separate you from His love. Not even the stupid things that you yourself do. Nothing. Nothing present, things to come, things seen, unseen, can separate you from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus. He's an all-powerful God. And this psalm is a benediction to the psalms. Look to Him. Know Him. Bless Him. Because He is the one who blesses you. We've come to an end of our journey. We are reminded of unity. We're called to bless the Lord. But isn't it good to know that He blesses us? Throughout the Psalms, there's a common statement. Blessed is the man. Blessed is the man. Blessed is the man. I've given you all the references in your bulletin if you want to look at them later today and read through all those Psalms. But I want to invite you to stand and I want to read select portions from these Psalms. And if you feel comfortable today, you don't have to turn in your Bibles to this. I'm going to do this. Um, just let it wash over you. And if you're comfortable, if you feel like you can express worship this way, Maybe lift your hands right now as a symbolic reference of receiving the blessing of God. And if you're comfortable enough on occasion, say an amen. Let's, let's listen to these psalms of the blessings of the Lord. Blessed is the man who walks not in the counsel of the ungodly, nor stands in the path of sinners, nor sits in the seat of scornful. But his delight is in the law of the Lord, and in his law he meditates day and night. He shall be like a tree planted by the rivers of water that brings forth its fruit in its season, whose leaf shall not wither, and whatever he does shall prosper. Amen. Psalm 32. Blessed is he, the man whose transgression is forgiven, whose sin is covered. Blessed is the man whom the Lord does not impute iniquity, in whose spirit there is no deceit. Psalm 34, this poor man cried out, and the Lord heard him, and saved him out of all of his troubles. The angel of the Lord encamps all around those who fear him and delivers them. Oh, taste and see that the Lord is good. Blessed is the man who trusts in him. Oh, fear the Lord, you his saints. There is no want to those who fear him. 
Psalm 65, verse 4. Blessed is the man you chose and you caused to approach you, that he may dwell in your courts. We shall be satisfied with the goodness of your house, of your holy temple. Psalm 94. Blessed is the man whom you instruct, O Lord, and teach out of your law, that he may give him rest all the days of adversity until the pit is dug for the wicked. For the Lord will not cast off his people, nor will he forsake his inheritance, but judgment will return into righteousness, and the upright in heart will follow it. Psalm 112, 1 and 3. Praise the Lord. Blessed is the man who fears the Lord, who delights greatly in his commandments. His descendants will be mighty on earth, the generation of the upright will be blessed. Wealth and riches will be in his house, and his righteousness will endure forever. Last one, Psalm 84, several verses. How lovely is your tabernacle, your dwelling place, O Lord of hosts. My soul longs, yes, even faints, for the courts of the Lord. My heart and my flesh cry out for the living God. Blessed are those who dwell in your house. For they still, shall be, they shall still be praising you. Blessed is the man whose strength is in you, whose heart is set on pilgrimage. For they'll go forth from strength to strength. Each one will appear before God in Zion. For a day in your courts is better than a thousand. I would rather be a doorkeeper in the house of my God than dwell in the tents of the wicked. For the Lord God is a sun and a shield. The Lord will give grace and glory. No good thing will he withhold from those who walk uprightly. O oh, Lord of hosts, blessed is the man who trusts in you. Amen. Heavenly Father, we give you thanks today. We give you praise because you are a great God who blesses us. When we think about it, when we stop and think about the fact that you found us when we were dead in our sin and you gave us life, you gave us a purpose. You gave us a love for you. And we're reminded in your word that we love you because you first loved us. And you brought us into fellowship with yourself and you've given us fellowship with one another. What are we doing, Lord, when we waste our time?